here we are. <laughs> well, after that performance, I don't think you and I have much to add. <laughs> uh, we're like a dessert. I, that was phenomenal. Then, well, so, should we talk about your book? Yes. Okay. Um, the two protagonists of the Thousand Splendid Sons are Mariam and Laila. Uh, if they were on the stage with us today, how would they describe each other? Um, you know, I, I think they would describe each other as mother and daughter, mm. even though they're co-wives. I mean, that was the, the, the arc of any book is very difficult to figure out at the beginning, and at least for me. And it really isn't until well into the process of, of writing a book that I kind of figure out what the book is really about. And when I was writing A Thousand Splendid Sons, I, I kind of had an idea that I want to talk about the struggles of women in Afghanistan, this very painful, brutal, and heartbreaking story that in many parts of the country is still ongoing. Um, but halfway through the writing, I realized that the, the part of this book is the relationship, this weird, unlikely relationship with these two women. Um, one lacking children, the other one lacking a mother, finding each other under, under very brutal circumstances, living with this very violent man, and yet somehow in the midst of all of this chaos, finding this beautiful relationship. So I think they would describe each other as, as mother and daughter, um, more than friends, I think they're more than friends. Um, I did not expect that answer, so that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, just um, following the train of thought on you and, and uh, writing about these women, how did you develop such distinctive voices? I've been asked by so many people that how could a man write a woman <laughs> so well? Yeah. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that. Well, um, Marianne is my favorite character of any of my books. I really love her a lot. Um, she's uh, very dear and close to me, and uh, I speak of, of her as a real person because I feel like I've known a lot of Mariams through my life. Grow, growing up in Kabul, walking down the street, and seeing these women that were working, you know, as, as, as uh, you know, working as, as house cleaners and, and doing laundry, and women who never went to school, grew up in villages, and yet there was this beautiful, kind of a quiet, dignified sense about them. I feel like I've known a lot of Mariams throughout my life. I went to Kabul in 2003, learned a lot firsthand about what happened to women, and again, I felt like I walked down the street and I saw a lot of Mariams. Um, and so for me, um, I'm writing Mariam was, was a, a process of just um, letting her come to me, uh, without trying to sound too precious. I, mean, I think when I first wrote, wrote the book, I thought I had to put myself in, in her place, I mean, Lila's place, and kind of see the world through their emotional filter. And, and, and it's obviously absolutely uh, impossible because, you know, I'm a you know, grown man living in California, and there's these two women living in uh, this very, very difficult marriage in Kabul. Um, but I, what I've discovered was a very fundamental lesson, lesson about writing. It was not so much to put myself in their place, but to just give them space to grow and not try to force it. Just be patient with them. Just trust that they will eventually make their way to me. And as I wrote one or two drafts, slowly I felt that the, the women, these two women, were so much closer to me. And it was like I woke up one day and I kind of felt like I knew them. I, my wife will tell you that I'm clueless about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but these two specific women, I felt like I knew very well. Um, so that by the end, once I knew them, then the ending of the book was was clear. Uh, you know, uh, the carrying over, gave it away. So, um, and if you haven't read the book, I guess you deserve it. But um, <laughs> I knew that that the book would end with this very beautiful and painful and really kind of heartbreaking act of sacrifice. That that one of them was going to get away and one wasn't. And I, writing it, it was in the fog. I, I couldn't tell who it had to be. And it really wasn't until I, I discovered who they really are. What is it that drives them? What is it that they want out of life? What is it that they're lacking? Um, that I knew that, that it would have to end the way it did. Well, the book was published many years ago. How does it feel to have it read out and you reconnect with Laila and Marianne? Um, I found myself um, 
feeling very kindly towards it. <laughs> it's always a bit of a dicey um, situation when you go back and read your own writing from many, many years ago. Um, and usually you walk away. I, I actually had to do it. I, 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 I annotated the kite runner for a, a big auction. And I meant I had to go back and reread re -read the book <laughs> and uh, make notes on the, on, the, on the margins. And there were parts of the book where I was fiercely proud. I was like, oh, this still works. You know, good job. You know? <laughs> and then there were great parts where I was like, oh my god, what was I doing? You know, and I, I would write this so differently. And I think every, every writer feels the same way because, you know, we're, we're, we're people, we grow up, we change. It's a dynamic thing. You know, we, we're not, I'm not the person I was in, in 2002 when I was writing a kite runner. I'm not the person when I wrote A Thousand Splendid Sons. But just from the passages that Denmo was reading, and maybe it was also her lovely reading and, and David's beautiful um, music, beautiful and strange, and <laughs> eerie and, and lovely music. Um, that I felt like, wow, that still works. You know, that that's that's still that's still moving, and I, uh, you know, I was moved by it. Yeah, me too. It was it was beautiful. I heard Denmo read it, but today it was just very very special. But 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 I think your answer was really about the stage adaptation, and and I I. I'm really, really excited about next year. I think this play is going to be, um, I think it's going to be very special. Uh, just having had the uh, privilege of sitting on two workshops and seeing how it's developing and the, and the things that Ursula has done uh, with the adaptation. She's not here today, but she's a very, 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 very talented writer in her own right. And um, I'm very excited. I, I don't think of my novel as a stodgy, static thing. I don't think any novel is that way. I don't think people read Tolstoy the way we read him now. God, I, mean, I don't mean to put myself in that sentence, but <laughs> in, 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 I realize what I just did. Um, any, any book, any, any novel, especially a novel, is, is a, a living thing, you know? And, and I, I, I never really understand why people think, uh, oh, they ruined that book. No, <laughs> you know, it's interesting for me to see another person's interpretation of, of what I thought. I've already seen this book in my head, and I kind of know what it looks like. I'm very interested in knowing how other people see it, what they bring to it. Um, and a writer's job is never done. I'm, I always want to edit my writing. And, and sitting on those workshops, and the hearing the back and forth, uh, which seems to take out, which seems to leave in, what works, what doesn't, it's, it's really like re-editing my book. And, and it's, it's, a, it's really a fun experience. It's, and it's also very, it's kind of eye-opening to see how other, people, how, how other people interpret what you wrote. The first time you met Ursula Rani Sarma, did you give her an idea of what you hoped would be the final outcome? Uh, and as, as uh, we know, Carrie is very, uh, has very strong vision. So how has it been, the collaboration between the three of you? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that if, I mean, obviously if you have a, a book or, or a piece that's being ad adapted, you do have to put it in capable hands. I don't mean to say that, you know, just watch anybody's interpretation. Um, you know, by the time that that happened, I had, I had been coming to ACT for years, and I, I really liked theater a lot. And I, I was a big fan of the theater, and I, I, I knew um, I, I knew of Carrie, and I knew that she had really good taste, and that she was really a terrific uh, artistic director. And um, and she really sold me on Ursula. I said, you know, I really feel I, I also felt it should be adapted by a woman. I really did. I, I thought this, the, the voice and the, the, the sensibility that, that, that Ursula brought uh, has, is bringing, uh, still bringing to this um, script is just, it's just, it's just lovely, it's wonderful. So, um, you know, I'm really excited to see, to see where it goes. We got a little flavor of it today. Um, uh, but I, 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 I I, I trust your instincts, Carrie. <laughs> I have been having a sad with you. I do. I, I think you have terrific instincts. I really, really do. Not a million people have told you that. But I really do. I mean, this, this brilliant idea of, of uh, Wish Upon a Star played on a saw, but I mean, what a lovely touch. You know? <laughs> Among many, many others. So um, for me, it's just, uh, just been uh, just a really a fun ride. And it's obviously still going.
I understand this weekend uh, an opera that's written for A Thousand Splendid Sons is going to be staged in New York. Oh, yeah, well, I think quite a while from now. Operas take a long, long time, but uh, there's a woman in New York named Sheila Silver who's made it her life so work <laughs> to make an opera out of A Thousand Splendid Sons. Oh, wow. um, she went to India, lived there for six months, and learned Vaga scales to incorporate some you know, Eastern elements into into uh, the opera. So, but that's, I think, farther down the line. Oh, it is. Okay. I must have misread yeah, that. That's, that's farther down the line. Well, since this book is about Afghan women and um, everyone is always curious about what is happening in Afghanistan, what will happen to Afghan women's rights into the future, um, do you feel the state of Afghan women have improved since your first visit in 2003? And I could ask you the same question because I, I, I know we both, um, we, I, I haven't been there in a, in a handful of years now, but you know, I, I, I think it's a mixed bag. I think there are parts of the country where women have, have made very good advances uh, by Afghan standards, um, and mostly it tends to be in urban centers. For example, in Kabul, we have women who are sitting in parliament, women who are on television, on the radio, uh, working in hospitals, teaching kids in school. And then there's parts of the country where, you know, it's same old, same old. You know, parts of the country where women have um, lamentable situations, you know, very poor access to legal rights, to education, to health care, um, uh, both uh, cultural, geographical barriers to them living, this, you know, uh, having their autonomy. Uh, the parts of the country where Things haven't changed all that much since the Taliban left. And the parts of the country, well, things were like that before the Taliban came. And so the struggle of women in Afghanistan is an, an ongoing story. Um, I feel personally we need a sweeping cultural shift in Afghanistan. The hope that I hold on to is that the median age in Afghanistan is 17. Like something like 60% of the country is under the age of, of, of 21, I think. So it's a very young country. The internet has made its way into Afghanistan. So you have a lot of young people with access to uh, the outside world, which Afghanistan, like the Taliban, was the most insular, insular place. Um, so now people are being exposed to outside ideas. These are very, Afghanistan is especially the place like Kabul, a very sophisticated urban young population. And that's my hope that with access to the outside world, bringing in new ideas about the environment, about women's rights, about uh, uh, you know, education and so on, will spur a change. But you know, whether it happens in my lifetime, I don't know. I'm hoping it will happen in my son's life. I'd like to sit right here that um, But it's a marathon. You know, it's, it's to undo centuries of, of, of uh, um, uh, you know, the way women have been living in Afghanistan. It's just not something that we can, um, you know, I always used to kind of giggle in, in the, the Bush years when, you know, it was like, well, let's, let's, let's inject Afghanistan with a hypodermic and democracy and women's rights, and by the next election cycle, we'll have really good news to tell people. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> this is going to be a lot harder than you guys think. Well, um, the Khalid Hosseini Foundation, which uh, Khalid and his wife co-founded, does a lot of work, so you're actually taking active part in, in making a change in Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sober about, about I'm, I'm sober and humble about the extent to which I can uh, bring change in Afghanistan. I, I have absolutely no, um, I, want, I want to help uh, as many people as I can. There are people, and we focus on women and children, um, but any um, true, lasting, enduring change in Afghanistan has to come from the Afghans themselves. It, it, it's not going to be the, the British, it's not going to be the Americans, the Canadians. It won't be us uh, living uh, in exile. It will have to happen indigenously in Afghanistan. Uh, my last question before we go to audience's Q&A is um, that your mom was a teacher yes. and also a vice principal of a school. Did she influence your writing in any way? Um, no. Um, <laughs> she, she, it's Q&A time. <laughs> I'll tell a funny story.
story about my mom. So, so uh, and we'll end on a, on a, on a funny note. Um, no, she, she influenced my writing, but she was very nervous um, when I, I used to be a physician in another life. And so around 2004, I was, I was trying to write A Thousand Splendid Sons, and I just, I, I just didn't have enough time. I had patients to see all the time, and uh, I just needed, so I took a year off. At the end of that year, uh, by the end of that year, the kite runner was, had really taken off, and I was writing a, finishing A Thousand Splendid Sons. I told my parents that I was going to resign from medicine, and that I was going to focus on writing. And, um, and uh, my mom said, uh, looked at me in a very kind of, like, I could tell she was worried, because she was trying to keep a, <laughs> a very calm uh, demeanor. And she said, well, um, you know, I went to Costco and they didn't have your book. So, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, That's a real Afghan yeah, woman speaking, was, Costco. Yeah. I think she just didn't want to, that, yes, very true, but also she's kind of proud that, you know, her son, the doctor, and you know, all of that. Um, and then A Thousand Spaces came out, and I remember she walked, uh, she walked very proudly into the house, and she had a, she was guest prep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have someone with a microphone, uh, and uh, Anyone would like to ask Khaled a question, please raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. Can you see Ali back there? Yeah. Yeah, there's um, hard someone. To see in this okay, they answered everything. Yes, yeah, really so, Since you publicly stated that your mother had little to no influence <laughs> on your creativity, could you please um, introduce in your way, the way you were discussing your characters, your own family now, your son you mentioned, your wife you co-produced, so there, thank you. Sure, um, my mother um, and father were both uh, educated people in Afghanistan, they were part of a kind of a upper middle class, I guess, uh, crust. Um, the kind of people in uh, Kabul, the kind of part of a community that was um, being sort of had, had kind of Western sensibilities to some extent. So, you know, my dad drank scotch at home. He prayed, but he also drank scotch. <laughs> you know, my mother never did. Uh, but but they were you know religion was part of our life, but it was never imposed. Um, my it, it was sort of kind of left up to us as to whether we wanted to pursue Islam or not. Although you know we were taught Islam in school, and uh, and certainly my parents prayed at home. Um, they were, you know, my, we, I have four younger siblings, I'm the oldest, and we lived in Kabul until 1976. Uh, my father was a diplomat, and he was assigned to uh, the Afghan embassy in Paris. And that turned out to be sort of the watershed moment in my life, because I think my, my life would be very, very different if we hadn't left. While we were in Paris, the Soviets came to Afghanistan, and we became refugees and uh, came to the United States in 1980 and settled um, in San Jose, where my parents lived sort of in the same square mile for the better part of three decades until my dad passed in 2009. Um, so, I don't know how much more I should say, but my mother lives two minutes from me and I, she comes over like four nights a week. I see her all the time. <laughs> she asks me how the book is going and I give her a kind of a reassuring answer and she we move on to something. <laughs> and, and your wife, Roya John, and yeah. Farah. Arana. So Roya, Roya is actually the one that has had um, real influence on my writing. She's my home editor, so she edits everything that I write. Um, I don't send anything to my publisher until Roya has read it. Um, that particular process is both a blessing, because how many writers are lucky enough to have a spouse at home who can edit their book and whose opinion they trust? Uh, it can also be very painful because Roy is, a, is exactly the kind of editor you need, which is a very honest one. So if you've labored for six weeks on, on a handful of chapters, and then you hand them in, and then they come back, and there's like red marks, and crushed marks, <laughs> and I will never forget, it's sort of imprinted on my mind, where they were... <laughs> it's going to make it sound awful. She really is lovely. But <laughs> 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 
I remember this, this, this one page I had given her, and I, I, I can still see it. There was a, a single red line going across it, and in red on the margin was LOL. <laughs> <laughs> that one took some getting over. It's kind of, sort of what I, I, I need, because the, the last thing you want is, is some unctuous relative who just, oh, yes, it's brilliant, you know. We really need somebody to say, you know, this isn't working, that's working. That's what, that way, when Roya comes back and she says, she nods and she says, this is really good, or I really love this, then, then, I, then, then I suddenly have peace of mind, I can move on. Uh, anyone else? Oh, hi. I'm just curious, how do your books are received in Afghanistan? Um, can you repeat the question? How the books are received in Afghanistan? Um, you know, I think it's mixed. I think there's, um, in the younger, more urban, professional, more likely to be, uh, uh, you know, on the internet and everything, I think in that group there's a higher uh, level of acceptance and appreciation for my books. I think in the older, more conservative, um, a more sort of, um, you know, uh, circle of wagons kind of, for them, it's a little bit more difficult because, you know, um, they, they, they see my books occasionally as um, portraying a negative image of Afghanistan. Uh, they have received letters that say, Listen, why can't you just talk about how, you know, we beat, we beat the, the British three times and, you know, we have such a proud uh, history and why don't you talk about the beautiful things? Which possible because I thought I did, <laughs> um, but I, I'm not interested in, in writing about the proud history of the proud people of the proud nation of Afghanistan. That's like some is creepy. It's a little propaganda, like you know. I, I wanted to write about my country lovingly, as a person, uh, not as a as an adolescent who looks or as a child that looks as, at their parents as infallible and permanent and, and absolutely faultless, but rather as a grown person who can look at their parents as the as the lovely but fallible and flawed people that they are. And that's kind of how I, how I look at Afghanistan. It's a beautiful place. It's, the people are gorgeous. Uh, and geographically, it's beautiful. I'm very proud of being there, uh, of being born in Afghanistan. But I'm also very recognizant and sober of the many, many problems the country faces, many of them, the roots of which lie with us. Um, so um, for me, that, for me I'll, that's not an easy message to hear for some Afghans, because they, they, they have a you know, Afghanistan for them is, is everything, and, and it's, they just view it in a very different uh, way that I do. Um, so for those people, my books can be problematic, especially the first one, which dealt with some real live wire issues, the whole ethnic, um, we've just gone through several years of, of brutal ethnic war in Afghanistan, and those wounds are still fresh. So that book touched a lot of nerves and became a real kind of a, a, a very divisive thing in our community. But by and large, by and large, I think um, I, I have a, a lot of Afghans. I, I, I really want to take my hand to them and give them credit. A lot of them say, look, you know, this book was like a, these books are like a shot of Prozac <laughs> into our arm because we're depressed about our way our, our country is portrayed. It's always the Taliban, it's always war, it's the drugs, it's the war, nor this corruption, it's this and that. And in many ways, it still is. Um, but, you know, they say, you know, your books at least show the rest of the world that there's more to us than that, that, you know, that, that, that we're a lot alike. Like, with the rest of the world, there we, have, we share the same, the same hopes, the same aspirations. We want peace. We want education. We want democracy. You know, and and, and from that regard, I think they can they can appreciate um, my books. But I think any person who writes like, in exile about their home country will have a healthy club of critics back home. <laughs> <laughs> well, in addition to that, the literacy rate in Afghanistan is quite low, maybe around 20-25% for men. So, uh, Khaled is basically talking uh, about a subset of the population as well. Yeah, so. uh, it's the illiteracy is, people have, frankly, people have much more urgent things to tend to, <laughs> like shelter and food, rather than the sort of the critic of a, of a, no, a, a critiquing a novel. And I don't say that facetiously, they really, really do. I mean, for a lot of people, millions of people in Afghanistan, the simple, uh, the, the horizons are very, very short. It's a day, two, three days. I don't know if I told you, but I recently uh, was exchanging email with someone in Afghanistan, and I said, I'm going to be working on your book, A Thousand Splendid Sons, and, and he was like, oh, isn't that about lesbians? <laughs> 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 
I, I meant to email you that information. You know, it's funny because you told me I want to ask or tell you something you've never heard before on stage at the Strand, and now you just did. So. <laughs>